Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley. And one of the things I get asked quite often is how do you protect a ham radio system from an EMP attack? All right, so I spent some time the last couple of months looking this over, um, reading publications, doing some hands-on tests, and I think I've come up with a very effective strategy for protecting your amateur radio system. So let's just walk through first, talk about what the threat is, right? If a nuclear EMP occurs, you end up with a very broadband pulse of energy that comes down from high in the atmosphere, right? And that manifests as two threats to your radio system. The first is you get this radiated energy that just flows through the air um, that can couple into anything, but it couples very efficiently into long conductors, right? The shorter the conductor, typically the less efficiently it couples into it. So this radiated energy couples in, and certainly it would couple well into the antenna wire and the antenna that's, that's attached to it. So that radiated energy would certainly couple into that antenna. Now, it could also couple into the radio itself, and it could couple into the power cord at the front end. But one of the primary concerns is the energy that couples into the antenna. And the reason that's such a concern is it's connected to the portion of the radio that's very sensitive, right? The portion that is trying to receive energy and and, and amplify it and decipher what's being transmitted to it. And so this transceiver at the radio is very, very sensitive to unwanted transient energy. And so that connection from the antenna is really um, one of the primary ports of, of entry for that dangerous energy that can damage the radio, all right? The second place that energy can come in and cause damage is through the power cord itself, all right? Now, the power cord, of course, is connected up to the grid or whatever your power system is, and there will be a large conducted pulse that will flow down um, the grid wires, the transmission lines, in the case of an EMP. So that big pulse of energy, you can think about it, you've got some huge pulse of energy coming in that's going to flow in through the power lines and into the radio system itself, right? So we have to address that as well. So we've got two primary threats. We've got the radiated energy coming in, and we've got this transient pulse coming in that's a conducted pulse. All right, now without any protections, either or of these could certainly damage the radio. Um, so let's talk about what kind of steps we would take to protect our system. Okay, so I've gone ahead and modified the drawing with the protections that I recommend. Let me just walk you through them, okay? So the first thing to know is that when you're not using the radio, it's just sitting idle and not using it, you should unplug it and you should switch the antenna over to some kind of a dummy load, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. The idea is to get the radio where it doesn't have any long connections to it when the radio is not being used, all right? So you'll unplug it from the wall so that it doesn't have power, and you'll disconnect the antenna through an antenna switch, all right? So I'll talk, again, I'll talk about that antenna switch in just a minute. So that's the first thing to know, is that when you're not using it, get it disconnected from those long wires. The second thing is when you're not using it, cover the radio system with a conductive cloth, all right? Now, I sell some EMP cloth is what we call it but it's just conductive cloth. So get a, a piece of that conductive cloth and drape it over the uh, radio system when you're not using it. That will help protect from some of the radiated energy that might try and couple into the radio itself, all right? So that's the protections when you're not using it. Now, when you are using it, there's a few things you can do to greatly improve the protection on the radio. The first thing is you can look at this power connection that comes into the radio and you can use a surge protection device that has a little outlet on it that you can plug into. I know you can find them from Triplight and other companies if you just search Amazon. You can find a surge protection device that's a little outlet that you plug into and that then plugs in turn into the wall. Okay, so it gives you a surge protector right at the radio system which is really nice to have. All right? The next thing you want to do is you want to take a broadband ferrite and you want to place it around the power cord as close to the radio as you can. Now, we sell broadband ferrites at disasterprepare.com. I'll put a little link for them, but you can find them other places if you want, all right? You just want to make sure that it's broadband and it covers the frequency range of an EMP, okay? Again, close to the radio. And that does a very good job of protecting the power connection to the radio. Okay, so now protecting the antenna connection is a little bit more difficult. The first thing you want is an antenna switch, as I mentioned. And you want to have that antenna switch so that when you're not using the radio, you can switch it over to a dummy load, right? Typically, that's 50 ohms. You want to size this 50 ohm resistor to the radio itself. If the radio will output 100 watts of power, you want to make sure you size the resistor accordingly. Okay. Now, the reason you want to size the resistor that way is it's very easy to forget that you've turned the antenna switch over to that dummy load, and then you bring up your radio and you try and transmit, and you're not 
connected to the antenna. And so all that energy goes into the dummy load. You don't want to overheat that dummy load and burn it up. All right, so you want to size it appropriately. Now, some people might say, well, why put 50 ohms there at all? Why not just leave it disconnected? All right. And the reason you don't do that is when you try and transmit, again, if you accidentally leave it in that position and you transmit, you'll send that energy out that wire. It'll hit the open stub and it will reflect back and you'll get a very high voltage standing wave ratio. And that energy that gets reflected back can actually damage the transceiver in the radio. All right, so you don't ever want to transmit into an open load or usually into a short circuit either. All right, so the 50 ohm load is a good uh, way to do that, good safe way to do that. So this antenna switch gives you a way of disconnecting the antenna when you're not using the radio. That's its primary purpose, all right? So when you are using the radio, you'd switch it back over. So now that you're going to be transmitting and receiving through the antenna. And what you want to have is you want to have a really good quality arrestor there, all right? Now you can buy lightning arrestors pretty cheap, but you want to have one that's very high speed, like a nanosecond or a nanosecond and a half turn on time, which is very rare and very unusual for lightning arrestors because lightning is not nearly that fast, right? So they don't need lightning arresters that will operate that fast. And I'll talk about a part that I found that does have a gas discharge tube that's fast enough to protect from an EMP. So anyway, you want a very high speed gas discharge tube based arrestor, and it wants to, you want it to have very low let through energy levels. You don't want much energy to get past it and down into your radio system because radios are so sensitive to unwanted energy. All right, so this is a key component, maybe the key component of the entire protection scheme. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of them that I looked at and one in particular that I recommend. All right. Now, if you don't like my recommendations, you can go out and shop your own and find one that you like. You want to consider a few things when you do that. You want to consider what the frequency range of that arrestor is, what connection types it has, is it bidirectional or unidirectional, and does it do a DC pass or DC block. All right? The only time you really need DC pass is when there's something out at the, maybe where the antenna is mounted that you want to have power provided through that same coax connection. All right? Most of the time, I don't recommend that because by having a DC pass, you essentially uh, prevent yourself from having a, a blocking capacitor in the unit, okay? So those are some of the things you'd want to consider if you're going to pick your own. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out a handful of them on the table, and I'm going to talk about those different arresters that I looked at, those different surge protectors, if you will, and I'll tell you one in particular that I like, and then I'm going to show you how you can get one for a discounted price. So as part of my investigation into surge protection for the antenna connection, um, I looked at about 10 different uh, lightning arresters and surge protectors. I've got a handful of them sitting on the table here. And they're very similar. Their form factors are a little bit different. Some are sort of cheaply made. and You can tell you know, that they're everything about them. The, the ground connection is really flimsy. Um, I wouldn't recommend them. They're, they seem pretty fragile and pretty flimsy. And others are pretty good. You know, they have uh, good solid bodies. Um, the connections are all clean and reasonably made. They have a decent size uh, ground connection as well. Now, inside of it is some kind of a di gas discharge tube. So in the case of this one, you can unscrew this top here and you can pour out the uh, gas discharge tube, which is just a little protective device here. And so they're all very similar in that they have some access port where you can get to the gas discharge tube. But they're not all equivalent. They have different things about them that you'd want to consider. And so some of them are, they have very different ratings in terms of the voltages and the power levels that they can handle. Um, so that's something you definitely want to consider. They also, some of them have different type of connectors. Some of them have N-type connectors. Some of them have UHF connectors. Um, probably if you're just using a, a ham radio, you have a UHF, UHF connection, but you can easily get a UHF to N-type adapter for a, a couple of dollars. And so I wouldn't let that discourage you. Just know up front that they, they might have different connections, so you might need some little adapters, all right? And maybe more importantly is they have different performance, all right? If you measured the voltage standing wave ratio through these different products, you'll see some significant differences. And what I found is when I tested them, you use a network analyzer to test them, and I've connected them up and tested them. In fact, I'll show you in a video how that's done. What you find is that their ratings do not always match the reality. If you actually take a measurement, you'll find often that the, the standing wave ratio is higher than what they claim it is, all right? Um, so, you know, it's some indication what the rating says, but to really know for sure, you'd want to measure the product if you could. So the standing wave ratio really tells you it's a measure of how much energy is reflected back. So if you put this in line with the antenna and the, the transmitter transmitted energy, some of it gets reflected back and it creates a standing wave on that connection line. And you want that standing wave ratio to be as close to one as possible. 
So some of the devices will say they have a standing wave ratio of 1.2 or 1.3, uh, 1.1 maybe if it's a really good one, okay? And closer to one, the better, because that means you're not losing power when you're transmitting it. That's not getting reflected back there, all right? So different types of ones. Now, which do I recommend and why? Um, of all of these that I looked at, and there's others that I don't have on the table here, there are a number that are well-made, like this one's well-made, it's very solid, um, but it's sort of a nameless brand, and it didn't look to me like the connections were, um, you know, well-machined. There were some issues with the pin being centered and things like that, and you don't know what gas discharge tube is in it, you don't know what its performance characteristics are. So there's really only one I found that, um, that I could recommend for an EMP application like this. It's made by Polyphaser. Um, it's a really great quality product, right? Unfortunately, it's you know, much more expensive than all the rest is the way these things go. But this product was made specifically for EMP protection, and so it has a really fast gas discharge tube in it, much faster than all the other ones. It also has an extremely low voltage standing wave ratio of 1.1 or less, all right? So it's a great product. Um, it offers up to 500 watts of power through it, up to 50 megahertz. You can see that on the data sheet of it. And it's just an extremely well-made product. It's got a, a really great mount to it, um, so you can get a really good connection for ground, um, whereas some of these others, like I said, have really kind of flimsy connections. So it's a fantastic product. Now, the only disadvantage I see on it is it has N-type connectors, and so you'd need an N-type to UHF adapter. But again, those are a few dollars, and it's not a big deal to get those. N-type is sort of an industry standard for most uh, RF applications, all right? So in this case, the antenna attaches to this end, the radio attaches to this end, you mount, mount this uh, on the, a flange or something to hold it, and uh, you ground that connection uh, so that the energy gets dissipated through that ground connection. It's very important to attach the ground of these arresters, all right? So this is the one I recommend. Now, as I mentioned, the the problem with it is it's much more expensive than these others. It's about $130, where some of these might run you $15 or something. Um, I think $130, it's worth it. It's a well-made part, but I think that's also pretty pricey. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy, if I buy a whole bunch of them, like hundreds of them, I can get a pretty good deal on them. And so what I'm going to do to save people some money is I'm going to buy a whole bunch of them, do a big bulk buy, and if you want to get one for a discounted price, I can still save you some money because I can get a good enough price on it in a bulk buy. You can get one from me, all right? And these will be genuine parts. That's the other thing I found is I found a couple of companies selling parts that when I received them, it was clear they were knockoffs. So be real careful about that. If you find something that's too good a deal, it's probably not legitimate, all right? It's been my experience with a number of things. Now, so I'll buy these polyphaser EMP surge protection devices in bulk and then if you want to get one, you can go to the website. I'll post it on the screen here, um, and you can get one at a discounted price, okay? So that's my discussion of the surge protection devices. Again, the only one I could really recommend is this one specifically designed for EMP. And personally, I think it's well worth the money um, because it's, it's probably the most susceptible portion of your radio system is the energy coming in through the antenna.